All right, open your Bibles tonight to Acts chapter 10. Acts the 10th chapter, and we start in verse 1. We'll only do half the chapter this evening, down through verse uh, 23. And the Lord willing, we'll save the second half for this coming Lord's Day morning. All right, so you know where we're starting? And have I mixed it up or not? I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to see. No, I'm straight up tonight. So chapter 1, ascension and appointment. Chapter 2, Pentecost and Peter's preaching. Chapter 3, lame man and lesson. Chapter 4, restraint, release, and request. Chapter 5, deception and detention. Chapter 4. Uh, six, seven selected. Chapter seven, Stephen stoned. Chapter eight, what well, S's in a row here? Samaria and salvation. Chapter nine, which we just covered. More S's. <laughs> Saul saved and Dorcas delivered. And the chapter ten, which we begin tonight, is entitled Cornelius converted, or the the obedience of Cornelius, which we don't actually get to. His obedience this evening, but that's what the chapter will focus on. I want to begin this evening sort of in a overview mode before we actually get to the text. So this is a this is a high above view before we actually get to the to the trees. I look at the forest a little bit. I, I think I want to make these points for a reason. To me, we have reached another biblical milestone in this chapter tonight, and I hope you'll see why I phrase it that way just here in a moment. So just review-wise, long ago, what did God promise Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis? Verse 3. There, of course, there were the three promises. But specifically, he said, And in thy seed shall who? All nations or all families of the earth be blessed. Well, that obviously includes who? Not just Jews, but Gentiles. So that was the original promise, to bless all nations uh, through the coming seed. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at a verse there. 1 Peter chapter 1. And Peter, as he begins writing his first letter, he makes a point that I believe is germane to this discussion. When he says at the end of verse 9, he's speaking about salvation, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So even the prophets, during those hundreds of years, the, the centuries of the prophets, they continually pointed to this. What Peter just says, there, they didn't have all the information. They, they inquired. They wanted to know. But they were thinking about this coming time. Hadn't happened yet, but they were inquiring about it. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Familiar passages to us. Ephesians, the second chapter. And that may seem like a lengthy reading, but I want to read 11 through 16, especially toward the end of that selected passage. Look what Paul says. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 11. Speaking, of course, Ephesus was comprised both of Jew and Gentile brethren. It was not a Jewish city. Ephesians 2.11, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, he's speaking to Gentiles, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you, who once were far off, <clears throat> have been made near, brought nigh by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, now carefully look at verse 14. Who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body, speaking of the, the church, the kingdom, through the death of Christ. So you can see Jesus' own death, which we covered at the end of the last quarter of the, the Life of Christ, Part 3, 
that certainly closed the gap, didn't it? At least in the mind of God, that brought the Gentiles near. It took away the commandments of ordinances, the law that kept Jew and Gentile separate. But what hasn't happened yet until tonight? That's right. Only until we get to this point. All these points right here to me, I'm going to call them preparatory. And I, I, I don't mean that disrespectfully or in a demeaning way. But not until the events of Acts 10 does all that come to fruition. Because as of yet, there have been no Gentile converts. It's either all been Jews or proselytes. Strictly a Gentile, there haven't been a one until Cornelius. So to me, that's a great biblical milestone. That, that's, a, that's another turning of the corner, if you will. And I think it's important to stress that to the children that you teach next quarter. Because as far as I can tell, we're all Gentiles. <laughs> that certainly applies to us. That's very germane to us. So I wanted to give that sort of a, a high overview of what's happening in this chapter. It's a well-known story. We, we know it well if we've studied Acts for any number of years. But I wanted to sort of couch it in these Old Testament references, sort of appreciate what's happened in terms of the chronology of the events as, they, as they've happened. And we get to that point now in this chapter. All right. David, your hand was up a moment ago. Yes. Peter mentions those are hard. For all. Kind of like the name, yes. Them, Correct. But even then, they're, they're, they weren't there yet. So it, we were, we, we, we've been inching more and more toward it, and tonight we get there. All right. A short review with, with a map. Last chapter, Peter was in what two cities? Do you remember? Lydda and Joppa. Lydda is where he healed Aeneas, who had been paralyzed for eight years. Healed him where he could walk. And in Joppa, what was the miracle there? Dorcas or Tabitha. She died and Peter raised from the dead. And, and in fact, in the text with the Lydda story, Luke even mentions the all who lived in Lydda and Sharon. That is that plain area. They believed. They were witness of that great miracle. So we've been in this area right in here. Now if I take these marks away, we go up now to Caesarea tonight. And where is Peter? Where did we last leave him? He's been in Joppa. So just by looking at, a, at a, a, an ordinary common Bible map, roughly speaking, these two are about 30 to 35 miles apart, so they're not like hours and hours away. I mean, travel was a lot harder back then than it is now. We can drive that in less than half an hour. But for them to walk, maybe catch a boat, go from Joppa to Caesarea, however they got there, uh, would not be terribly, terribly far in terms of other travel that's been made. So that's, that's where we are on our on our geography, if you will. Okay. We'll start in the first two verses, and these verses describe who Cornelius is. So let's read verses 1 through 2 together. Now, there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, or the Italian band, which is a group of soldiers. Verse 2, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his house, and who gave many alms to the Jewish people, and prayed to God continue. So look at these terms that describe this man. First off, he's a centurion, which means what? He commands a hundred men. So he's, he's, a, he's a man of authority. He's a man of rank, if you will. All right? And we take him in order here. It says he was a devout man. And that word devout means he's pious. He's dutiful towards God as best as he can, because again, he's not what yet? Not a Christian. He's godly. And I just pulled the definitions from Thayer's lexicon. So other verses in the New Testament use this term. These typically are used in reference to someone who has obeyed the Lord, who is a Christian, but it's used here of Cornelius. So it tells us the kind of man that he was. But we do make that distinction because he's not yet in the body of Christ. He won, he's one who feared God. The base word of this is of the Greek words that talk about being a, a phobos or phobia, where we get our English words, certain different kinds of things that we're afraid of, acrophobia and uh, claustrophobia and so forth and so on. So it means to one, one who reveres, who has reverential obedience or deferment to God in its highest sense. So he, not that he was afraid in dread of God, but that's part of it, but he, it, it's more along the lines of he had, he had deep respect and reverence for God. So... Uh, tremendous uh, statement about his character. 
He gave many alms to the Jewish people. He was charitable, very generous. Uh, some have suggested maybe he was a proselyte. There's nothing in the text that says that he was. He could have been for all we know. So whether he was or was not doesn't take away from the point that he was very charitable in what he owned and helped the Jewish people. And then Luke concludes this list by saying he prayed to God continually. My version says, does the New King James say that as well? Pray to God continually or something along those lines? Always. All right. This simply means to make continual supplication to God. So he, he was a man who prayed often. And again, that's not a bad thing. So if you look at all these together, just sort of a, a group statement about his character, we could succinctly say, here was a good man. He's just a good man. All right? And the world needs more good people. <laughs> we would all agree with that wholeheartedly. But now let's, let's ask some questions that get us into uh, texts that we really won't cover tonight. They're, they're saved more for Sunday, but we sort of hint at them tonight. If nothing else was known about Cornelius, which we've got more in the chapter about it, but if we do nothing else, if this is all we had, what would the average Bible reader conclude, do you think? Yes, exactly. I think we would conclude, anybody would conclude, here's a saved man who's right with God. Because what person does these things, especially uh, fearing God, being devout, and praying to God continually? That's got to describe a saved person. Has to. And I would say ordinarily it does. But this isn't all we have known about Cornelius. There are other revealed facts about him later on in this chapter, and when Peter has to give a report of his actions in chapter 11, which we'll get to, more evidence comes out. So we're going to go ahead and ask the question, would this be a correct conclusion? The answer is no. It would not be correct. Look, for example, at verse 6. Now, I want somebody who uses the New King James to read verse 6 for me. This is, this is in Cornelius' vision. Just read verse 6 for me, Gary. I think you have the New King James, don't you? He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. All right. Now, some versions do not include that last phrase, some of the older manuscripts. That doesn't mean that's a point of contention because, look in chapter 11, Gary, read that for us. Well, look at verse 14 when Peter has to retell this episode to the Jews who contend with him on this. 11 verse 14. So the context would be... Uh, well, start in verse 13. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Now, that's clear. That, you can't get any clearer than that. So in these other verses that talk about prayer, uh, if one is separated from God in the general sense, in, in the general sense, God does not hear their prayers because there's no relationship there. Now, is there a way, and we'll get more into this in a moment, is there a way in which God heard Cornelius' prayer? Well, I think we have to say yes. But was there a covenantal relationship where he was his child and he could call upon God as his father in a prayer relationship? And then we'd have to say no. So that's the distinction that we're going to get in this evening. And not just tonight, but even in, probably in our lesson on uh, Sunday morning as well. He can and does. If your heart is not right and you're praying to God and you're not, you know, it doesn't matter. Correct. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more on those kinds of issues. Eric, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up. That's kind of where we're going to go with this, with this notion of, well, did he hear Cornelius' prayer or not? Well, I'd have to say yes and no. It depends on what you mean by that. I mean, he heard his prayer, yes, because he sent the angel to tell him. In fact, look at verse... Um, Verse 4, which we'll see just in a moment. Your prayers and alms have ascended to as a memorial before God. So God heard them, but is there a relationship there? No, not yet. And that's what I mean when, they, when I say that there's a distinct difference between, between the two. Okay, and just to review, we're going to come back to this. There's a, I believe, a teaching point and an application I think that we can make at the end of our lesson tonight. Okay, now, that's his description. Now, there's two visions in the, in the chapter, or two episodes that are of a supernatural nature. One is for him, Cornelius, and one is for Peter. So let's look at Cornelius' vision first, verses 3 through 8. 
So Luke just simply says that this was clearly, this vision was clearly an answer to his prayer because God dispatched an angel, it says in verse 3, at the ninth hour of the day he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in to him and said to him, Cornelius, addressed him, fixing his gaze upon him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. So an angel reassured him that God was aware of his prayers and his deeds, which God, as Gary pointed out, God knows the heart. He, he's omniscient. He knows everything. So this wasn't like uh, it was a, a, a surprise or shock to the Lord. God heard his prayers. But here's how he answered. He sent an angel to Cornelius with specific instructions, which we've already alluded to in reading a verse we did a few moments ago. He was given in a specific instructions. Look at verses 5 and 6. We read verse 5 and 6. Dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon. He's also called Peter, which again links us back up to how chapter 9 concluded where he was after he raised Dorcas. In verse 6, he's staying with a certain tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. And then other versions uh, add that last phrase, he will tell you words that you need to hear, uh, just paraphrasing. Now, I want to ask this question. These, these instructions that are, that are quite specific, why would he have been so instructed? Why would he need to hear words from someone else if he was right with the Lord? I would think that he would not have needed. So we can only conclude that he was not right. Again, verse 22, well, later on in tonight's lesson, um, they said uh, when, uh, he, when he sends messengers to Peter and Joppa, they say, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. He's got to go, he's got to hear a message from a spokesman of God, which in this case is an apostle, Peter. So we must conclude that he was not right. And that's why this is being played out the way that it is. How did he, how did he comply with this? Did he, or do you get the idea of just reading this, that he had to think on it for a while? I get the idea of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act on this immediately. I've been told to do this. I've been instructed to do this. And I'm not going to waste any time. When the angel who was speaking to him had departed, verse 7 reads, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier, so a group of three. Um, and after he had explained everything to them, he sent them off to Joppa, which is that 30 to 35 mile journey from where he was down the coast from Caesarea to Joppa. So there was his vision, and there was his response to the vision. It's pretty straightforward, nothing, nothing hard about that. Now, here's the other vision. And whether you want to use the word vision or trance, I think my version says Peter was in a trance in verse, uh, the end of verse 10. But let's, just for sake of comparative um, presentation, we'll, we'll call it a vision as well. Verses 9 through 16, Peter has a vision. So the next day, as they were on their way, they've left Caesarea, coming down to Joppa. So as they are on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, which is noon. And verse 10 says, he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance or a vision. So as Cornelius' messengers traveled to Joppa, Peter fell into a trance and after he became hungry while waiting for the noon meal to be prepared. And he had a vision. Now, quickly, what was his vision? I'm sorry? All right. A, a sheet-like object. My, my version says a, a certain object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. So it's just floating, <laughs> floating down out of the sky, coming down to earth. And what's on this sheet? All right, all kinds of animals. The text says, on or in it, or on it, were all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. So critters were on this thing. Some kind of animals. Well, <clears throat> this is going to go a certain way. So after he sees this sheet come down and he sees what's on it, there's a voice, isn't there? And it's identified as uh, whether it's God's voice or one of his spokesmen, 
but they're speaking for God, so it might as well be God speaking. And God commands Peter to do what? In fact, what, what were the short instructions? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Uh, pretty simple. And what's Peter say? I'm not doing that. In fact, he says, not so. My friend says, by no means or not so, Lord. That, that is not going to happen. And what's his reason? I've never done that, and I'm not about to start right now. It's basically how we would interpret that. That's in verse 14. By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. So all I know to conclude from this is that on this sheet were what kinds of animals? Unclean by what standard? The law. The law would have deemed these animals. You can read these texts in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. There's all kinds of instructions in those chapters. What you can and what you can't eat if you were a Jew. What was allowed, what was not allowed. Both of animals that, that chewed the cud and divided the hoof and vice versa. Ones that flew in the air, ones that crawled on the ground. You, you Fish out of the sea. I mean, the whole list is there. And uh, a faithful Jew would know. I can eat that and I can't eat that. I can't eat that, but I can eat this, so forth. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. But we only conclude, I think, because of what Peter said, I can't, I can't touch that. I've never done it before. I'm not about to do it now. All right. So as we go on this straightforward story, Peter's misunderstanding was twofold, I believe. He missed the mark here in, in, in two ways. Because after he says that, what's the response in verse 15? Yes. So, God stated here, or his spoken, we were doing the talking here, that, that the uh, dietary restrictions were no longer valid. And in the grand scheme, how do we know that, this side of this event? What's happened to the law? It's no longer binding. We'll look at some passages in a moment. Again, I think that's a, a teaching point there. Um, that's not in force anymore. And Peter is hearkening back to, a, to an obsolete or a dead covenant. So what was unclean then is, by definition, now it is clean. So he, he misunderstood that. And secondly, the, the greater lesson here is, God intended Peter to make a much bigger application than just the animals, because if we jump way ahead to verse 28, when Peter gets to Caesarea and in Cornelius' house, look at the connection Peter makes, verse 20 of chapter 10. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with the foreigner or to visit him, and yet God has shown me that I should not call any man any man unholy or unclean. So God's greater message wasn't can you eat or not eat the animal, which that was germane to the law, yes, but God's after a bigger point here. And Peter understood that when he got to Caesarea and talked about it, but here he still missed it by, by not realizing that if God called it clean, then you can eat it. And it's, and it's, 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 a, done, it's a done deal. So that was Peter's misunderstanding. What happened to the sheet? In the, in the vision once this conversation was over. After how many times did this happen? It happened three times, this episode. And I get that, that Peter gave the same answer all three times. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And then the sheep disappeared. And that was the end of that vision. So this vision happened three times and then disappeared. And as chapter 10, verse 17 begins, what's Peter's mindset? Kevin's smiling. He, he's confused. <laughs> What did this mean? I don't know what's going on here. So he's greatly perplexed. And I've got, to, I've got to get my head wrapped around this. So the rest of the chapter concludes with joining the first two events. Cornelius has sent his messengers. And Peter's vision is over. Now they're coming to where Peter is. So now they're going to have their, they're going to have their meeting. So that's where we are now, 17 through 23. So as I just mentioned, verse 17 begins with Peter's perplexity. Uh, just he did not understand it whatsoever. And while he's thinking about it, obviously trying to reason it out, who gets there? Well, obviously it's the three men that Cornelius sends. They arrive at Simon's house, and then just, again, straightforward text, they inquire about uh, uh, if, if he is the, if, if, if a Simon called Peter is there, and obviously he was, and so all that those niceties, those inquiries are, are made. And so when they, when they finally get that out of the way, 
Peter has one more instruction, doesn't he? Before he goes to meet the man. What else is told Peter? Go with him. Don't doubt. I'm yes. In my, my version says, uh, Behold, three men are looking for you. Then in verse 19, Arise, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings. Do not question. Gary said, Don't doubt. Don't, don't wonder about this. This, I'm behind all this. You just go. You, you, you do what they ask you to do and don't sit there and question and wonder and so forth. And No, you just go. So that's what Peter is instructed. The Holy Spirit instructs Peter regarding the reason for their visit. And Peter identifies himself. Look at verse uh, 21. Behold, I am the one you're looking for. For what, what is the reason for which you have come? I don't think Peter knows that. That's why he's asking. He's not been told the reason why they're there. He just has been told, whoever these men are, you just go with them. And so he is told now in verse 22, well, there's this man named Cornelius, and uh, he's a centurion. We read this verse previously tonight. Righteous God, fearing man. He was divinely directed by an angel to, or for you to come to his house, and he wants to hear you Say something. He, he wants to hear a message from you. You've got to go speak to his house. It's just a straightforward explanation. And so this, this little meeting concludes by what action happens in verse 23. This, I mean, what anybody would do. Just be polite. Once you stay the night, we'll start out in the morning. We'll go tomorrow. So Peter invites them to spend the night, and then they depart for Caesarea. And also, who, who else is back on the trip besides Peter... And the men who have come to get him, who else goes? There are some men from Joppa who are brethren, members of the church there. <clears throat> we don't know how many. But they're going to go with Peter. Now, who asked them to go? Maybe it was their idea. Maybe they volunteered. Maybe Peter asked them to go. We don't know any of that. But they're on the trip as well. So there's just the first half of the chapter. Just pretty straightforward events. We get this description of this good man. And then uh, he has a vision. And Peter has a vision. And... Those two visions sort of get joined together when Cornelius' messengers get there and Peter learns, well, I've got a mission. I've got to go and speak to this man in his house in Caesarea. And that's where, we, that's where the curriculum has us dividing the text. Uh, we'll talk about our applications and lessons just in a moment, but we'll cover the last half on Sunday. So anybody have a comment or a question before we get to the applications? Well, just, it doesn't matter. But, uh, well, it might. Well, over, over in uh, 11, uh, 12, we're told that Okay, thank you. There, there we go. So we do know how many. Six men. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Anybody else? Before we get to the teaching points. And again, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Not significant, that significant either, but it's probably providential knowing that he was about to kind of drop a bomb on everybody that, he, that they would have extra witnesses besides just Peter's word. Okay, so that, that's a good point. This is, so, you know, this is an important event. And perhaps that's why they went. We, we don't know. But that would certainly help solidify by testimony what took place. Later on, you know, we're told not to accept certain things, you know, unless by two or three weeks. Okay. That, that, yeah. that may when, be a good point. And when you read verse 12 and 11, he's saying, well, the Spirit told me to go. And then the New King James says, moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. So I think it is. I, I agree with that. Yes. I think that was God's providence in saying, hey, this isn't just Peter just talking off of his head. Correct. He's got these witnesses. Because he's being called to account for it by Jews in, in that chapter, and, and they're there to back him up and say, yes, here, here's how it played out. We saw it. Most definitely, that's, that's how it occurs. So I, I think that's a very good observation. Appreciate that, Rachel. Okay. Now let's look at our, I got two teaching points and one application to look at as we end our class tonight. And they, of course, have to do with this very familiar story. And again, I think these are ones that can be made uh, in the children's classes. I think these can be explained and they, they, they need to be able to see these, these overarching lessons. All right, the first teaching point, I believe, is that simply being a good person, that's just not enough for one's eternal salvation. Now, it's not that we're against being good. That's not it at all. But the, the majority of the thinking out there is, what kind of person do you need to be to go to heaven? 
You need to be a good person. You know, don't cheat on your taxes and you coach the little league and you don't beat your wife or kick your dog or whatever the you know whatever the thing is. Just just be a good person. Be a good neighbor. Be honest on the job at work and go to church. You know, at least once in a while. Those kinds of things. And uh, that's the prevailing thought out there. But I I believe this story takes that out of the way and for, for these reasons. Who among us would doubt Cornelius' goodness? I mean, just if you just look at that description again, if that's all we had, which it is not, but if that's all we had, no one in their right mind would say, well, he was an average guy. I mean, he, he wasn't bad. No, he was a good man. A very good man. But there's a distinct difference between being good and being saved. Now, there just is. And I believe this story bears that out. Again, go back to chapter 10, verse 2. There's his description. And then a verse we've looked at three times already tonight, chapter 11 and verse 14, where as Peter retells the story, he was told to speak words to, uh, to you, by which you and your house will be saved. So he was not saved. He was, he was in an undone condition. So, yes, there is a difference between being good and being saved, but there is no difference between a good lost person and a bad lost person. Lost is lost. Saved is saved. And Cornelius cannot be held up as an example of, well, here's what you got to do. Just be like Cornelius before he was baptized. No, that's, that's not going to cut it. And so the idea, the point is not to call into question someone's goodness. That's not our job anyway. That's not our position to say, well, good enough, uh, not good enough, so forth. That's not the point. The point is what? Here's, here's the point. Whether or not a person has complied with God's revealed terms in terms of salvation, that's the issue. Have you done, have I done, what God has said to do to be saved? That's the issue. And had Cornelius done that yet? The answer is no. Despite his goodness. Now, if we stop here and think for a moment, because he's this good a person, which pretend we don't know the end of the story yet, He's an, he's an honest man. So what would a good, honest person do upon hearing the truth of the gospel? By and large. You obey it. Especially if he's one who fears God and prays continually. He's wanting to know the truth. So hopefully, that would be my state and your state if we're not a member of the body of Christ but we're interested in things that God wants us to know, then when I hear the truth, I'm going to say, yeah, I'll believe that. I'll, I'll obey that right now because I want to be right with God. I want God to be pleased with me. So here's a man, here's a test case, if you will, where being good is just not good enough. But the world would say, oh, yeah, just be a good person. Well, it wasn't so with this man. And I think children can understand that. I think we need to explain it in a way that they can, that they can get that. So there's, I believe there's one teaching point. Another teaching point, I believe, would be this. The law of Moses is no longer in force. And again, I don't think this is as big a lesson to learn as the first one. But I believe this text does teach this. And here's the reasons why I believe that. Uh, yes, God's main point, as we noticed in chapter 10 and verse 28, the main point was that Peter should call, the Peter should call no man unclean or unholy. That's the, that's the greater lesson here. But God used as an object lesson formerly unclean animals that would have normally been unlawful to eat. But the answer, when Peter says, I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. I'm not done that. And God's immediate rejoinder in verse 15 was what? Well, what I've cleansed, you don't get to call it unclean. And so that tells us, I think the, the point that that tells us is, is that there is a distinct difference between the covenants now. And Big picture again, what do we know about the two covenants from verses like uh, Colossians 2, Hebrews 8, and Galatians 3? What's the, what's the main lesson there in the New Testament? The, the law is out of the way. It, it's over. In fact, let's look at, I, I want to read, uh, let's look at the Galatians 3 verse. We have time to look at that just for a moment. Galatians 3, the first part of verse 19 well, Paul asked the question rhetorically, what purpose then does the law serve? 
Now watch carefully. It was added because of transgressions. Till when? Till the seed should come. Well, in Cornelius' story, has the seed come? Yeah, that's over. Christ came. The church is in existence. The kingdom exists. So Paul wrote this later than this, but the point is, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That is, back to Genesis 12 again. Verse 23. Before faith came, that is the gospel, before the faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Well, has the faith been revealed? Yes. So the covenants have changed. And I, again, I think our children in our Bible classes, they need to know, you know, we spend a lot of time studying the old law, and we need to do that. But please don't miss the opportunity when we get to this point to teach them, but that law is over. It, it, it has ceased. We're now under the new law, the law of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, the gospel age. And so I think that needs to be emphasized, and I believe this story teaches us that. Okay. Quickly now, I believe, uh, well, let me, let me back up here. This is an important distinction that many people don't get, as well as many denominational churches, that they don't teach this. And I think we need to make sure that our children understand that. Okay. One application I've got this evening, and that's this. Uh, Cornelius' attitude regarding seeking God and His will should be our attitude. I think we need to imitate Cornelius, whether we're a Christian or not. Because we, we never stop seeking God's will in our lives, obviously. Already established, he's not in covenant with God. He's, he's lost. He's not saved when the story begins. And making an admission, even though God was not Cornelius' father by covenant, uh, since that's the case, Cornelius did not enjoy a covenantal relationship with God that includes prayer. Again, I'm going to ask the question, did God hear his prayer? I think the answer is yes. But is there a relationship there where we can continually call upon God in prayer as our Father? We pray daily. No, there's not. Now, he prayed continually, but there's no relationship there. I think we need to make that distinction. So, I believe this illustrates this truth, and I think this is important. If an honest person seriously seeks God's will through God's providence, what will he do? As in this case. He'll provide a way for that person to hear the truth. In this story, who was that conduit? It's Peter. So what if you're out here somewhere and you really want to know God's will? And so you, you pray to God, and I would never discourage anybody from praying. That's not the point. But there's, there's, there's no relationship there. But you want to know the Lord's will, so you just keep praying. What's God going to do? I believe it's all my heart. He'll work out a way for somebody to come teach you to hear the words of the Lord based on the new covenant and you can learn what to do to please God and be saved, just like Cornelius did. I think that's just a powerful truth. And he had the right attitude. He hungered and, and thirsted for righteousness. He sought first the kingdom of God, Matthew uh, 5, Matthew 6. Colossians 3, he sought those things which were above. That's what he was after. He didn't have all the answers yet, but he was searching and he was seeking. And I think God provided the way for that to be taught. And that was the Apostle Peter. So I think that's a noteworthy attitude. God said to do, he did it. Yes, absolutely. Which is our lesson on Sunday. That's right. There was no delay. Absolutely no delay. All right. Great story, a familiar story to us. Again, we'll pick up the Lord willing Sunday morning in verse 24. And we'll finish the chapter and make our comments about that part of the chapter as well. Thank you again for your participation and your attendance tonight. Always means a lot to me.